So good afternoon, welcome to the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar Series. This series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois. And on behalf of all of us, we want to thank USDOT, CN, BNSF, Hanson, and Union Pacific for their support. It's greatly appreciated by all of us here on campus and by those uh, connecting via the internet. I want to extend a warm welcome to the folks that we have joining us via the internet. We have over 150 folks joining today from a variety of of uh, organizations including Transport Canada, Trans Systems, WSP, WMATA, Voslo Fastening Systems, TTCI, University of Connecticut, Progress Rail, STV, Pandrel, Montana Rail Link, Shannon and Wilson, and about another 100 that I'm not going to read right now, but it's a <laughs> tremendous, tremendous turnout and we appreciate you all joining us online. Um, if you whether you're online or here on campus, if you're interested in getting a PDH for today's event, please send an email to, uh, to, to the Hay Seminar email address as was indicated in the email that you received. So I'd now like to introduce today's, uh, today's presentation. Our seminar discusses the implementation of emerging technologies in remote sensing to the condition monitoring and performance assessment of railway infrastructure. Some of the technologies include digital image correlation, radar imaging, and other vision methods. They include unmanned aerial vehicles and a variety of other topics that have been developed as a part of the Advanced Railway Technology Group at the University of South Carolina. Specific case studies we'll hear about today include rail neutral temperature, uh, drones and their ability to detect uh, damage or, or defects within the track structure, satellite radar imaging, and also uh, geohazard triggering around railroad rights of way. It's now my great honor to introduce our speaker. I had the privilege of picking him up at, at about 1 a.m. at the airport last night. So today, today that's, to, that's more accurate today. So um, and, and Professor Rizos is a great friend of our program here. We've been fortunate to interact with him for quite some time. So on a personal note, before I read your bio, it's, it's great to have you here on campus uh, once again. So. Uh, Dr. Dimitris Rizos is director of the Advanced Railroad Technology Group and the coordinator of the Railroad Engineering Program in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Rizos is an associate professor of structural engineering and mechanics, and he has expertise in structures, soil, track and vehicle dynamics, and has worked on many uh, software implementations and other modeling projects. His recent academic and professional interests are in the fields of health monitoring, diagnostics and, pro and prognosis of uh, track and structures and their health. And he's been involved in a lot of remote sensing, including stereo vision, drones, and satellite radar imaging. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Rizos to give his seminar titled Remote Sensing Techniques for Railroad Infrastructure Monitoring. Thanks. Thank you, Abby. We gotta put this oh, on, too. Put this on first. Right, thank you. So can everybody hear me well back there, everybody? Great. It's a great pleasure being here again for the second time. Last time I visited, and uh, uh, that was probably two, three years ago, uh, standing at the same, same place, uh, talking about different, different projects. Uh, really, th uh, I appreciate your welcome last night and the fact that Raleigh stayed up very late. And uh, when the plane landed, I was escorted by fire trucks and all the lights and sirens. So that was a big, big thing. Uh, but uh, Regardless of how uh, cold and scary it feels getting in, I always feel safe when I'm in this, uh, in this room with you guys. I'm in, in real good company. So uh, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity and discuss some remote sensing uh, techniques that uh, have been developed uh, in our group over the last uh, three, four, uh, four, three, four years. And uh, quickly, we'll go through the uh, art program Advanced Railroad Technology Program at USC. Uh, brief introduction of remote sensing. So we'll put the, set the framework of what we're doing, and then we'll hit the uh, applications. And as an encore, we're going to have a few more projects that are uh, active projects. We, we uh, work on them as, as uh, we speak. So a little history. The whole effort started in 2008. Before then, there was nothing at uh, USC, U of SC, University of South Carolina. Uh, started with an NSF project on uh, uh, vehicle track interaction and uh, numerical uh, modeling. Uh, what made the change was uh, JRC 2010 when uh, it was here at uh, Illinois. It was hosted here and I was invited to attend the uh, RIS workshop. 
where I got all the material thanks to uh, the leaders in the field, uh, Professor uh, Barkan among uh, others. And uh, this gave us the initial push to move forward with railway engineering. In August 2011, we uh, I guess selected a, a name for ourselves. And since that time, uh, we've been working on developing the curriculum courses, the research program, and now we have uh, uh, graduate degrees and a graduate certificate in uh, railway uh, engineering. Keep people involved. <clears throat> Very proud to have this guy, who is uh, one of your own, uh, as my uh, right hand. A uh, lot of uh, work is uh, credited to uh, Dr. Chan. And we have people from uh, different departments across disciplines uh, on cybersecurity, computer science, data analytics. Uh, uh, Dave Clark is an adjunct professor working with us teaching uh, courses, person in drones, and so on and so forth. So the mission that we set for ourselves is to develop uh, automation information-driven practices to change the railway uh, engineering the way we know it, following a data-driven and performance-based approach. Th these are two keywords here, data-driven, the, the, the new uh, trend, performance-based, which also includes the fundamentals, the mechanics. So we cannot have one without the other. That's, that's our uh, goal here. And some examples of applications include the smart structure and infrastructure resiliency, smart power infrastructures, materials, uh, uh, and uh, cyber-physical fusion, cybersecurity, and so on and so forth. So we've organized, there are a number of faculty in the uh, College of Engineering that are involved in this effort. We're organized in four different areas, infrastructure, operations, analytics, and education. And each one of us leads uh, an area. Uh, infrastructure, analytics, and education are our strong uh, areas right now. Operations, it's an emerging uh, group uh, that started doing uh, work, especially under the uh, UTC uh, center that uh, uh, we have on transportation. And uh, all these efforts put us in good company. Uh, right in the center of, of, of action, Illinois. And uh, we can see our name there. So we're very, very happy to, to see this. This is, was an international, I guess, uh, uh, survey that was uh, conducted and these names came up. So anyway, in terms of the coursework, number of different courses that cover infrastructure, operation, management. Uh, dynamics are both at the senior undergraduate, early uh, graduate, and advanced graduate uh, levels. And uh, all these courses are offered through the Apogee program, which is a, our distance learning uh, program for synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, delivery of lectures. Now, the graduate certificate is a 12th grade hour certificate, uh, and the target market is basically everybody who has interest in uh, uh, learning something about uh, railway engineering. Some of our facilities, standard equipment that we have, but also state of the art. Uh, this is a, a newest uh, uh, piece of equipment that uh, was acquired, uh, triaxial, large scale triaxial uh, testing machine uh, with uh, high confining pressure, frequencies up to 10 hertz, and uh, seal specimen for saturation uh, case. You can see this in action. And some results fresh out of the oven. Uh, Dr. Chan produced this, and he said, make sure you show this. And we're very happy to do this. Number of cycles versus uh, permanent deformation of uh, uh, fouled ballast at different saturation uh, levels. Uh, capabilities, large scale testing of uh, structures in, in the railway and highways, but also uh, full scale uh, track for a uh, track panel. Uh, that it's at grade, we can turn it around in a day, we can rebuild this track in a day, and we can control the uh, water table, among other things. Uh, as far as instrumentation, all the conventional instrumentation. Of course, in addition to this, uh, we have vision-based uh, methods that we use for material component and structure level uh, measurements. And these are cameras, infrared cameras with uh, computers, non-contacting, non-destructive, allow for full field, uh, uh, deformation and strain uh, measurements. Some examples, tie testing, uh, we can get maps that show cracking and uh, you've seen probably some of these images here. Uh, also in, uh, in plan we can measure uh, transfer lengths using vision methods. Uh, and the latest development, we place this digital image correlation system on a drone. So we fly the drone and we'll talk, this is one of the uh, case studies that uh, we'll discuss. The drone flies uh, autonomously. 
uh, no pylon or GPS signal uh, required. And we can capture damage, but we'll, we'll talk about the details. Uh, sponsors and partners uh, really uh, appreciate the support uh, and uh, hope to uh, get more uh, logos uh, on both uh, sides of the slide. So with this brief introduction, I'd like to move forward with a uh, topic. Again, as part of our research uh, efforts and activities in the group, uh, we started working with remote sensing uh, projects, or projects that uh, we can implement remote sensing. So we'll look at the uh, short definition, the platforms and sensors that we work with before we move to the application. So by definition, we obtain remote sensing, obtain information about an object without direct contact with the uh, target surface, with the object surface. This term is not necessarily in uh, health monitoring, but it comes usually in conjunction with observation of the Earth. However, in a broader sense, we're going to use it here, and this we will include non-contact and non-destructive uh, techniques that also may include uh, all the wireless sensors and, and, and stuff, which we're not touching in this case. Uh, the sensors are mounted in different platforms uh, that can be grouped depending on where they operate, the altitude that they operate, ground level, airborne, or uh, spaceborne satellites, etc. The sensors themselves uh, are activated by different parts of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So we have the optical sensors, uh, our pictures, lidars, uh, infrared, and radar sensors. So uh, in, in our work, we've used uh, optical, thermal, and uh, radar uh, sensors. So moving into the applications. Let's talk about spaceborne systems first. And the implementation was in monitoring effects that trigger geohazards, like landslides on the right of way of the uh, railways. This was a project funded by University Transportation Center uh, that we're part with on connected mobility. So the, the objective here, again, is to uh, do something with the landslides, OK? Uh, because they cause significant damage uh, annually in the order of uh, billions. So the hypothesis here is most cases, the, the hypothesis is because most cases follow a triggering event, uh, we can detect these triggering events using satellites. And I will explain in a minute what I mean by this. For this, we're using the SAR sensors, synthetic aperture radar uh, sensors, which operates on the uh, radar frequency of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And what the difference of this sensor is with the optical? Well, when we take a picture, we need sunlight or we need some sort of an artificial light to illuminate uh, the target before we take the picture. With, with radars, the sunlight or the artificial light is not, uh, not strong enough to get a signal back. So the, uh, with radar signals, we sort of irradiate the uh, object with radar waves, uh, waves in the radar frequency, and the sensor picks up uh, reflections. So here's our satellite that uh, sends pulses of these electromagnetic waves to the surface. This is the antenna footprint, and waves go back to the sensor. And you can do geometry and calculate different features of the uh, target. But this is not enough. It's a, the footprint is small. So the very first thing that uh, was done was take the image at an angle. So you work with an ellipse instead of a circle. Even this is not enough. So uh, the next thing is to take those images and stitch them together. This way, we create a synthetic aperture radar, the SAR uh, image. Now, this allows for large footprints to be captured uh, by the sensor. The important thing here now is that depending on the, uh, on the wavelength, we have control of what the signal uh, reads and gives back to us. So for example, wavelength uh, uh, of, at the, the L-band, which is 24 centimeters uh, wavelength, uh, does a good job penetrating uh, trees, for example. Okay, so vegetation does not obstruct uh, the view, but also penetrates the ground. And depending on the, the strength uh, and the, of, of the reflected signal or some other parameters as well, we can tell what's below uh, ground. C-band has medium penetration ability. Uh, X-band sensor has small, very small penetration ability. And uh, this is typically used for creating uh, surface models. So here's the hypothesis now. Radar signals parameters are 
are described by amplitude, uh, intensity, coherence, phase, and uh, usually we monitor these uh, changes. So all these parameters uh, depend on what the reflected uh, waves are. So the reflected waves uh, in turn depend on the moisture content, any ground movement, uh, vegetation, target location, and so on and so forth. Then we said when we look at, at landslides, effects that may trigger landslides also deal with moisture content. And the hypothesis is that there is uh, slow mobilization of the, of the Earth before the actual event takes place. So we said we're going to put one and one together and see if we can use radar processed signals to detect uh, triggering effects of uh, landslides. To, for this, to this end, we use the INSER, DINSER, and PS-INSER processing techniques. Din, uh, INSER is interferom interferometric synthetic aperture. DINSER is the differential interferometric, and I will explain in a minute. PS is persistent scatterer. The difference between the three, this is the very first level of uh, processing. So you, have, you get one image, and you get the face out of this. DINSER is the case where you take two images, and you do comparison. You remove the terrain, and you see differences that have to do with the signal itself. Uh, PS INSERT, Persistent Scatterer, uses multiple images over a period of time and tries to identify specific points on the uh, surface, on the target, that will always give a, a signal and you monitor that persistent scatter. So it's point by point as opposed to uh, map. A uh, few things about the methodology. There's a lot of math and processes behind it. Uh, but here are the steps. I'm not going to go into detail. What you see here is some, the, this, this was the very first case that we worked on, Mount Etna, after the eruption in Italy. Uh, there were landslides, and we were trying to see if we could pick up those landslides, big events, so that they should be able to appear, right? So we, we captured that. Uh, the PS insert is what I was talking about, where you get multiple images and you try to identify points that persistently give you a, a strong uh, signal. So case studies. California Highway 1, big landslide uh, back in 2017, I think, right? Uh, the Mud Creek uh, landslide, this is what happened after uh, the landslide. This is the visual image uh, before the landslide and, and after the landslide. So the dashed line uh, indicates the uh, location of interest. So uh, the, we decided to acquire images from a satellite. These are historic images, so they are available in the public domain. So it didn't cost us anything to get those images. Uh, in the period 48 days from April 25th to May 31st, the event the, uh, was on uh, May 20th. So landslide took place on May uh, 20th before uh, and after. Uh, images were acquired every 12 days, because this is how long it takes for the satellite to go over the same uh, location and, and uh, shoot the radar picture. And we looked at the phase and the coherence of the signal. So here we are, the first period, second period, and this period pretty much gaps the, or bridges the, uh, over, over the uh, event. So we started looking at some disturbances uh, in the phase. Uh, and the corresponding uh, amplitude, and also coherence would change in this area. This was an indication that moisture content changed the characteristics of the signal. We have not quantified yet, so we cannot tell, OK, this mass change of the signal produce, it means that much soil moisture or change in the soil moisture. But this is an indication that something is about to happen, because we see quick change of that, uh, uh, of that parameter. Second one, TTCI facility. So uh, we looked at the TTCI at Pueblo for a period of uh, uh, about eight months, from August 2017 to uh, April 2018 should be here. Yeah, <laughs> 2018. Uh, there was no triggering event, but we just wanted to see if we can use can identify persistent scatterers and monitor uh, the movement. So uh, without doing any pre-processing or, uh, or, or pre-treatment, if you want, of the area, we just took the satellite images over that location. And uh, again, every 12 days. 
And this produced this map of scatters. All these are like different points that were identified in the images as points that consistently give a strong uh, signal, and that signal uh, changes. So over a period of, uh, of, of eight months, we have seen changes in the elevation. Order of millimeters, very small, very small changes. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we can pick this movement at the, at the resolution of a uh, millimeter, vertical uh, resolution. Of course, now we're in the process of validating uh, this, uh, these numbers. But there are other areas of application of these uh, satellite images. Oil spill mapping, uh, downloaded. Uh, this, this is the Rennell Island, uh, is in uh, uh, New Zealand. So there was an, a big uh, oil spill after a hurricane. And uh, this is the outline of the image as the radar captures it. And this is the oil spill. Because when the, the, the radar signal hits the, the water, water completely absorbs it, black, where the uh, oil itself reflects part of the signal so we can see where the oil spill is. Uh, this, this was an interesting exercise. I'm not, I'm not telling you location or, or uh, who it belongs to, but we were monitoring a mud hole next to a, a rail line, and uh, everything was quiet. In one acquisition, we saw a band of change in phase, and we said, oops, we have changed in moisture. But we couldn't justify it because we looked at the weather data and there was no rain in the area. So we'll, we asked the question, did anything happen during these days? And said, we got the answer, oh, actually, yes. Next to this, there is a recreational facility that occasionally is flooded to be used. And that's what we picked up. So this is very strong indication. We're very excited with our first baby, or not so baby steps anymore, uh, that we can actually see uh, things using, uh, see changes uh, using uh, a satellite. Uh, flood mapping. This is in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Pr the red dots is, shows presence of water. Uh, sorry, the purple dot shows presence of water. The red dot shows uh, saturated uh, soil. So, uh, DINSER and PSINSER, uh, the techniques are very promising in detecting uh, large-scale, small-scale uh, movement, and also changes in uh, moisture. And we believe they can be directly correlated and quantified with triggering events of uh, satellites. So the next project is uh, aerial systems, DIC in load testing and damage detection. So the objective here is, I mean, looking at different bridges, right? You're doing the inspection of bridges. You do load testing. There's all sorts of instrumentation that goes on, trying to monitor the performance, see if there is any cracking. Uh, and we're proposing to replace conventional instrumentation with drone-based uh, DIC system. This is the first implementation, I believe, in the world of a DIC system for such uh, purposes. I'll talk briefly about the DIC technique. Uh, we use optical sensors in this case, so it's the um, very narrow band that is captured by the uh, naked eye. And these DIC systems have been developed at the University of South Carolina for the last 30 years. Actually, the uh, inventor of the, of the technique, about a week ago, he became a National Academy member just because of, of, of his contributions to the area of digital image correlation. So it's a proven uh, technology, has been applied to a number of different uh, uh, industries, uh, aerospace industry, high temperature, high rate, automotive industry, and we're uh, implementing this now into civil engineering uh, applications. The way it works, right? We, you need a target. So this is the side of a concrete eye. Uh, that's a project that we had a few years back, uh, three, four years back. You need to apply a speckle pattern on the sides because we're going to be monitoring those dots as uh, the formations take, uh, take place. Set of uh, cameras to have stereo vision connected to a computer. Calibrate the camera so you can get the geometry, distances, and angles so you can uh, do the math. And then this is what the two cameras see, the left camera and the uh, right camera. We call this set zero. This is the initial set of images before any load is introduced. Then we apply the load, we load the specimen, specimen deforms, and uh, now we have set one and set one, 
a second set of, of images. Processing the differences between the two images produces maps of deformation, strains, and wondering about the accuracy. The formation, we can uh, uh, capture the, uh, the formation field with accuracy up to 10 microns. Strains uh, can be as low as uh, 30, 20 to 30 uh, micro strain. So 20 times 10 to the minus 6. So we decided to put this on a, on a drone. Uh, black and white cameras, uh, onboard color camera. So we have two sets of cameras here, one for navigation, the other one for uh, digital image correlation. Uh, wireless transmission, completely wireless transmission, multiple frames per second. We, uh, the, the systems that the uh, correlated solution produces can be in the order of uh, kilohertz, so it can get thousands of pictures in a second. Uh, and uh, uh, how we fly the drone? F manual, of course, fully automated through GPS, but also through feature recognition. So we put a target on the uh, we put a target on the, on the specimen. And this is tracked at all times by the, by the onboard uh, camera. So it, it always knows uh, where it is. One of the major issues that the drones had with bridge inspection was interference from uh, magnetic fields. So the drone would, go, would approach the, the bridge, but because of all the magnetic fields, would lose uh, its uh, position. Uh, so I think we. Uh, we, through the work of uh, the, the drone group, you can see them, this guy is here, uh, this problem has been uh, solved. So, this is what we see at the top, and at the bottom is what the drone sees. Okay, so the drone flies uh, autonomously. This is just a laptop that gets the images wirelessly. And uh, yeah, stop that. All right, sorry, too loud. <laughs> um, that woke me up after this great lunch. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, this is this this is. Fresh out of the oven. We, we got this back in uh, right before Christmas. So we're getting ready to start uh, publishing. Next step, we'll load a bridge. What the advantage is now? First of all, we verify the method, right? So how do we know that the drone data uh, is accurate? In the test, we had set a stationary system uh, behind the specimen and also set an LVDT uh, or L right at the mid span. So we measure the deflection uh, versus, or load versus deflection using the three systems. So here we have the top one is the uh, stationary DIC. This one is a drone based DIC and LVDT goes right in between. We have to remove it because we don't want to destroy it after it breaks. And you see a little discrepancy between the stationary and the uh, uh, drone system. This is only because the specimen rotated, where the LVDT was right under the center line of the uh, specimen. So we even captured that rotation of the specimen using the two, uh, the two systems. Notice, and, and this rotation took place after cracking. So things started not working uh, symmetrically. So a little bit of motion was uh, captured by uh, our systems. Now, in addition to the formations that we see here, we can capture the cracking field or cracking pattern, okay, as it is uh, loaded. So, get your uh, system in place, watching a bridge, let the train go over it, s monitor the strain field for potential soft spots that could lead to uh, cracking. Finally, ground systems. Uh, and the digital image correlation has been implemented in rail neutral uh, temperature measurements. That's what you don't want to see on your track. And this is due thanks to the sun. Okay, the sun that allows us to take this picture also damages the, the track, right? Existing techniques are destructive. Uh, they interfere with operations. Uh, and they can use methods that are 
uh, at this level at an experimental uh, stage. Difficult to implement, costly to implement. So we're proposing to use a vision a DSC system to measure rail neutral temperature. The question is, how do you do that? We're using combination of optical and thermal sensor, sensors in the DAC. But we have to start with a hypothesis. We need to know what to measure before we measure things, right? And what to measure in rail neutral temperature, the hypothesis is that because of the constraints, the boundary conditions that you have on the rail, both in the longitudinal direction as well as at the uh, tile location, the expansion is not uniform. The thermal expansion of the top of the rail is not uniform. So it will have this sort of uh, pattern. So this may be something that we can monitor. And the uh, uh, hypothesis here is that this is temperature dependent. So the higher the temperature, the higher the, uh, the change. At the same time, when we look at a, at a little square on the web between uh, ties, because of the constraints, again, the strain in the longitudinal direction is minimal or zero. And in the vertical direction, it's free to expand. Nothing to constrain. These are due to thermal expansion again. So we put this into a model, preliminary data, just to qualitatively verify that this was the case. We changed the temperature plus and minus 100 degrees from a reference temperature. And indeed, this is what we captured with our uh, model. And we captured this in, look at the strains, in the longitudinal direction, 1.3 microstrain, uh, in the vertical direction, 1,100 microstrain. So significant difference. Okay? Of course, this is under ideal conditions. Then we said, uh, OK, let's take it to the lab. So here is one rail segment, no constraints, completely free. We torch it. And here is a specimen that is constrained uh, at the two uh, ends. And uh, we monitor, in the case of the unconstrained, uh, we just monitor the web of the constrained specimen, the web, and the top of the rail with DIC. So uh, looking at the unconstrained specimen, the strain in the two directions is about the same as uh, expected, unconstrained specimen. So it expands in both uh, directions the same. And there is a linear relationship between these strains and temperature. So this is good news so far. Then we looked at the constrained specimen, and we see significant difference. We don't get the 1.3 microstrain, as the uh, model showed us, for a good reason, because constraint is not 100%. Uh, we just torched the specimen, so we're not quite sure how the Temperature was uh, distributed, but bottom line, we can see this, this difference, OK? Then we looked at the top of the rail and computed uh, the, these colored lines show the, the shape of the rail. So you get all the irregularities that you have on the, on the rail, et cetera, which by themselves, it looks like a spaghetti, right? So we came up with a concept of an average curvature uh, within a gauge length, and we plotted, we, so basically we fitted this, this, this data with a quadratic. Second derivative is the curvature. Plot the curvature, bingo. Extrapolate it to zero curvature, because that's where, where you assume the, st the stress-free condition is. And this is your neutral uh, temperature in the specimen. And uh, sure enough, we did the comparison with finite element, which has fully constrained. And we are within 7 degrees difference. And when we actually uh, set the specimen, constrain the specimen, the uh, lab temperature was at about 68 degrees, which we assume is the neutral temperature. So uh, the next steps, uh, yeah, so here's the method. Take two measurements at two different temperatures, extrapolate, get your neutral temperature, move to the square. The, the, the changes now will give you the slope. But because you have the neutral temperature, you have a unique relationship between the temperature and the strains that you measure. Knowing the strains, um, theory tells us plain strain conditions work and compute the stress. Validated this with numerical uh, analysis, and the accuracy was excellent. So parameters affecting the measurements. Uh, we've done a lot of parametric studies and uh, taking measurements also on the track. Uh, we started from a base model. Uh, very detailed model, even the uh, fastener system itself has been modeled and the rail pads and uh, the whole system. And we started changing the boundary conditions, thermal loading method, rail size, tie spacing, uh, and track uh, stiffness. On a specimen that's 180 inches long, this is what we have in our, uh, in our lab. So we, when we take the measurements from the track in the lab, we have something to compare it with. 
So none of the parameters affect the transfer strain. Transfer strain is the vertical direction, right, which is uh, free to deform. Longitudinal strain can be considered uh, zero or reasonably zero for all realistic uh, track systems. So very small strains in this direction. As far as the boundary conditions, we need to have either longitudinally constrained uh, rail or rely on the fasteners. If we have both, even better. Okay. Heating method, we decided, or we found out that heating the web produces the best results. Rail size doesn't have any significant effects. Tie plate stiffness, no significant effects on the deformation and the tie spacing. As the spacing increase of the ties, the measurements become better because we get higher uh, deformation. So it works to our uh, advantage. Uh, in our model, we use the 20 inch uh, center to center spacing. Uh, this came from uh, one design that uh, our sponsor uh, asked us to do. OK. So the next steps taking it to the truck and taking it to the site and start uh, validating we're in that, in that process. OK, so the little surprise here. Other remote sensing projects that we work on. And I know that uh, there is interest in this one, which is called ICATS. Uh, and what it does is a smart system for uh, telling uh, emergency responders that a great crossing is blocked and it will be available after so much time. So the way it is, uh, the way it is done, uh, cameras look at the uh, traffic, automatic detection of vehicles. Uh, then we correlate the, the length of the, of the queue to the time it takes to, to clear once the, the uh, crossing uh, opens. At the same time, we get uh, PTC information from uh, the train. It's passive, so it's not a two-way. We just, uh, and uh, uh, CSX, who is our partner in this, uh, has agreed to share this information. Again, it's passive information that shows location uh, of the train through geofences and, and uh, maybe speed. Uh, so we know when the, train, when the train comes, so we can predict also that the great crossing will be closed in 10 minutes uh, and uh, come up with different estimates. City of Colombia, our mayor, uh, jumped into the opportunity. Uh, Colombia is the first uh, city in the country that will implement a system like this. Uh, and again, all this is thanks to my right hand, Yu Yu, Dr. Chan. Um, intelligent Abnormal Situation Awareness Platform. Um, with these cameras, we can pick up abnormal behavior of pedestrians and vehicles and warn the railroads if uh, someone is about to commit suicide or an act of uh, terrorism. Another project that is currently funded, automated detection of broken spikes. So it is a problem. And what we propose to do, have a platform identify where the spikes is, at each spike send a laser uh, excitation and read uh, the response. What we've seen, uh, actually, th this is a little uh, video. This is a graduate student walking on the track with a cell phone, just capturing these images. And you can see how the spikes are detected automatically uh, through uh, uh, machine learning and, and, and image recognition. So now that we know where the uh, spikes are, we're getting the laser, shoot it, and read uh, the response. Uh, this has been correlated. So here we have a, a spike without any crack, finite element simulations. Uh, as it's excited at the top, you can see the excitation point, the waves propagate. But these patterns change when a crack is hit, partial crack or a uh, full crack. So we can pick up these changes in the signal and uh, uh, mark a, a, a spike that it's broken. So this is funded by NCHRP, Safety Idea Program. So in conclusion, uh, remote sensing techniques, ground, aerial, spaceborne systems, they work great. They're, the sensors they use are based on the electromagnetic spectrum. The great, great advantage, there is no, target, no, no contact with the target, or very 
minimal interference with a target. In the case of the DIC, you have to put a uh, speckled pattern on it, right? Uh, but the future, I believe, is at the cross-section of mechanics, data analytics, and artificial intelligence, OK? No matter how great the system is, you get the data. If you don't know what to measure and how to measure it, it's worthless. So uh, I hope that this captures the whole uh, idea behind uh, uh, today's uh, presentations. Application to railway infrastructure monitoring, they do have direct impact, does have direct impact on the operations, <laughs> maintenance, and system integrity and safety. So with this, I'd really like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions now or at a happy hour later, which could be, I don't know how valid they will be, but they will still be good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So I have a question regarding the spaceborne uh, detection system using radar. So according to your presentation, it seems like uh, different different radar uh, radar with different uh, wavelengths were were used. So they they have different like penetration capability. But but after uh, in the uh, case study, it seems like uh, only the like the surface reflection information was retrieved. So why don't just use one single model of the radar to retract, to extract the surface reflection. Uh, why, 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 uh, why do you use uh, like different antenna types or different frequencies? Yes. Thank you. So, so the question is uh, uh, again, we have different uh, wavelengths uh, of the radar uh, sensor, yet the results uh, only pick up what happens on the surface of the Earth. Why not use one uh, wavelength instead of uh, yes. the different wavelengths, right? So uh, let's say that we would like to monitor an area where, where, where it's uh, highly forested, right? So we don't have, there are a lot of trees, right? A lot of vegetation, a lot of trees. So you don't have direct uh, line of sight, not radar sight, but uh, uh, visual sight with the surface. So there you need to use a, uh, you need to use a wavelength that will penetrate the, 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 the canopy and hit the ground. Now, what you read back is always the same information, right? It's amplitude, intensity, phase, coherence. Uh, and based on the changes of these parameters, you can tell if this is movement or the change in coherence, for example, is because of presence of uh, uh, soil moisture. Uh, so that's the main reason why. Great presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question was also related to those radar images. Uh, it's, there are some satellite images, though, you showed us, right? The, uh, uh, the, the Google Earth type of images, you mean? Uh, I, I thought those were, in the beginning, satellite images, weren't they? The, like they when were you visual, showed the were uh, visual images. and things? Yes, they were visual images. Let me uh, go back to this. And I will repeat the question. So we're trying to. Okay, so, so here in this slide, we, we see satellite images that are on the visual part of the spectrum. So this is Google Earth, pretty much, right? This color maps is the radar image that is superimposed on Google Earth. And we do, because if you look at the radar image, Uh, you, you get in the same location, right? So the radar from the satellite, from the satellite yeah. And this, these images are uh, available in the public domain. So you just register and you download uh, the images that uh, that you need. Um, now, the remember we, we discussed the different bands. Yes. Not all of them are free. I have to say that. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Well, we've, we've used the C-band uh, sensor, and that's uh, available. L-band, it's not, we have to pay for it. Okay, but L-band has a uh, high penetration ability. But with a C-band, we can penetrate some uh, vegetation. Of course, clouds is not an issue, right? So the weather is not an issue. And uh, C-band is also what produced the uh, changes in soil moisture. I, th I thought so. <laughs> Other questions? Couple. Sorry, just two questions. One uh, goes to the goes to his question. Did you have you looked at other like similar uh, satellite images from other similar terrains <laughs> in that same of that same soil type where there weren't landslides? In other words, do you know? whether you're essentially just detecting moisture or are you actually detecting something that is likely because of the site or because of some specific of the, of the site to be right. something that's going to result in a landslide. How do we know that it didn't look like that a hundred times when it didn't landslide? Correct. So the, the, answer, the, the question is, uh, if we've looked at uh, images from other sites where no landslide has taken place and if we've seen changes. Or, or similar uh, changes to, let's say, to this, right? Uh, the answer is yes, we have. If there is no change in soil moisture, we don't see changes in the color maps, so changes in the signal. Uh, but potential of a landslide, well, it depends on the terrain. If it's, if it's flat, there is no landslide, right? Only thing we're picking up, and this was evident in uh, this study here. There is no landslide here, right? We were just trying to monitor what happens with this mud hole that occasionally would bring a lot of uh, water and mud out and will damage the, the truck. Uh, so no potential for landslide, but still we picked up changes in soil uh, moisture. And we were, we were tracking this for a number of days and we we'll always get that boring uh, graph. And then one day we, we saw that it was like, I told my student, well, probably you did something wrong there. You know, it doesn't make sense because we looked at data and then when we did a little bit more digging, we found out that, yeah, there is actually water. There was actually change in the water there. Thank you. And then the other question goes to the very end of the presentation. Uh, your inspection of broken, or your detection of broken spikes. Mm -hmm. Can you go on a little more into the detail of what the mechanism of action is there? You said it was laser-based. It's a laser-based. What's the actual physical phenomenon that you're looking Shock at? Uh, yeah, it's, okay. Just let me get to the slide, and I will discuss it. Okay, so uh, the question is, can you elaborate on the phenomenon behind the uh, uh, automated uh, detection of uh, broken spikes? So the, the, the idea comes from wave propagation, right? So if you, if you excite uh, a body at a point with a wave, those waves will propagate, will reflect, and you can get some reading out of this. And the, the, I, the initial idea is that the reading is that you get is different depending on the level of damage that you have. Okay, so no damage, we get one, I guess, uh, set of images of the wave field. If there is a partial crack, it is shown here, then the waves will propagate and will reflect back, they will not propagate any further because there is a gap. This is, this is visible, these are visible lasers or IR or, or what kind of power? I'm just, I'm just Surprised that you're seeing that effect with essentially live. I mean, I've seen the stuff with ultrasound the, radar and so forth. This is, this, is, this is a finite element simulation. So this is not the actual product of the reading. We just wanted to see what to measure, right? So the actual sensor is a, uh, a laser that you can actually, when you excite it, I don't, I don't quite remember because we're trying to configure the, the uh, pr proper uh, laser for that. We've, we've tried a couple that, you know, once you shoot it, you can actually s hear the, the, uh, the impact. So it's like a tough kind of sound, right? Okay. Uh, our colleagues at Electrical Engineering are helping greatly with this, so we're collaborating with them. But once this is, uh, once the spike is excited, then we use uh, acoustic sensors to pick up the, okay. the wave. Thank you. That's, yeah, what, yeah. that's what I was showing. Yeah. I think you can see what you're trying to see with a laser. Right, right. No, no, you don't, you don't see with a laser the inside. The laser is, is the excitation, and then the acoustic uh, vibration is what we, uh, what we will analyze for our uh, detection. Thank you. Yep. We you're welcome. Over there. Uh, 
Um, thank you for the impressive presentation. Uh, I, my question is also about the radar image, uh, especially the um, PS INSA technology. Right. Uh, as you are also an expert for the train track, in, the train track or soil interaction, and you should be familiar with the case that when the train passes by, the waves can be generated on the soil uh -huh. or on the ground. And, right. and my question is, uh, do you think that we can use this PS INSA technology to detect the waves generated by the uh, by the high speed train, for example. Yes, uh, let me get to the image. So the question is uh, on a rail track. As the train goes by, can we use uh, satellite radars to pick up the wave propagation of the waves in the track and the, in the environment? Right. Not at this point. Why? because we get images every 12 days. So uh, to do something like this, you need a, a high frame per second system. But the way we can, we were thinking of doing this is through the drone and the DIC, okay? Uh, one of the things that, that can be done because you get the drone, you get the excitation, and uh, we have uh, cameras that can run up to, if I'm not mistaking, 10 kilohertz, so 10,000 frames per second. Okay, so uh, hopefully we can see this vibration, but using a drone-based system, not, not the satellite. Uh, satellite technology is evolving so fast that it's expected in the next uh, two, three, five years we're going to get a, a higher acquisition uh, rates. Uh, and with a swarm of satellites, you can also start looking at the same point uh, from multiple angles, which greatly enhances the process. because. Come to think about it now, right? If, if, if you have a slope like this and then the satellite shoots like that, there's nothing you can tell on, on this side because it's obscured. Okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have one now. So, can we go to your DIC on um, rail neutral temperature? Or? Yes. So as you know, I mean, the rail engineering community considers this problem, you know, a solution to this, the holy grail of railroad engineering. So this is a very important problem. Um, and it's, it's great that you're thinking about it. I've never heard anybody think about this approach to addressing it. Um, I'm assuming that part of what, Part of your explanation would seem to me in this example would depend upon the use of um, a premium fastening system. Like if you had cut spikes there, you'd have a different situation, which doesn't nullify the value, it just constrains it to work in that situation. Is that correct? Uh, yes, to some extent, because the, the, the whole method does not depend on the fastening system only. So our parametric studies uh, have shown that you need to have constraints either in the longitudinal or at the fastener system. If you have, I mean, consider either or, okay? So uh, in our case, we have both. So if the fastening system does not impose the constraints that we want, we still have the longitudinal constraints that uh, will produce these results. And on top of that, if we need to, worst case, we can clamp the uh, the rail uh, down for the measurements. Can we go to one of your subsequent slides on this, though? Where you actually have your, yeah. Are you saying that, you know, supposing you're using a, a premium fasting system that does have, a, you know, a hold down for the tow load, that at some very minute level, there is a a wave form along the top of the rail surface? Yes. And we we computer analytically, and we see this experimentally, but we're still in the process of fine tuning it. It would seem to me that there's actually, besides the 
besides DIC, wouldn't there be other technologies that could be used to detect that? Possibly. But we haven't looked at other technologies because right. uh, right. my, my mind was worked. Yeah, possibly. I mean, so the method is not only DIC. DIC is the, the instrument that we measure. The method itself, the core of the method, is the observation of these deformation patterns and how these deformations are correlated to the neutral uh, temperature. So DIC is just the, the way to measure yeah, right. the techniques. And the whole thing started, the thing we, we were talking some time ago, and I asked you to be part of the, <laughs> of the project. Uh, uh, like, how can we use DIC to measure neutral temperature? So that got, that got me thinking. Uh, possibly, but we look at, at curvature, not the actual deformation, because that actual deformation can come from all different sources, right? So when, when you look at the curvature, this, this, this is the blue line, this is, this is the shape of the top of the rail. So if you pick a spot to take the measurement, I don't know. <laughs> the, 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 the trick here is if you look at the curvature, uh, yeah, this graph. The assumption is that at, at the stress-free condition, that, that surface is flat, or the average surface is flat, okay? So when you go above, you get positive curvature. Below neutral, you get negative curvature. That's something that you cannot pick up with a micrometer. And uh, in the process, uh, I guess this was the other breakthrough. When, when we first looked at the, at the shape, we were like, oh, now what? You know? <laughs> And then we said, well, we, don't, we don't actually need this shape. We need an, uh, an, an average curvature and how this curvature changes with temperature. So quadratic polynomial fitting, second derivative is that number that we were looking for. So we define a gauge uh, to take the measurement. Can you, can you go to the previous slide? Um, have you conducted tests, you know, we, thanks to the work of a number of people, one name that comes to mind is Andy Kish, retired from Volpe, um, but, you know, we have some understanding about what point um, constrained thermal stress becomes critical, and obviously is partly dependent upon support conditions of the ballast and that sort. But have you done tests at those levels of constraints? Not, not yet. What, we are at a point where we actually compute the longitudinal stress. Now, how this is used to decide if it's critical or not. And that's where I'm going with yeah. what, How would we use this to actually determine uh, a critical condition was developed? Uh, you got me started thinking again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the immediate answer would be plug it into existing models. We've got the right. CPR state. We've got a lot of things. This is a direct input into things that right. the CPR has. In a way, in some ways, your technology is opposite of a lot of the other uh, yeah. predecessors. Those we need long lengths. We need to excite the rail. We right. need to measure its response. Yours, you're actually kind of, you're, you're, um, taking advantage of the rail's natural state, which is constrained in a lot of dimensions right. close, with close spacing, and you're, you're taking advantage of that. So the way we, we propose to implement this, we'll be taking measurements on both uh, rails, and we'll just be moving the system down the, down the track. Multiple measurements, maybe in a statistical approach, uh, will give us an answer. Well, I mean, it strikes me. I mean, I don't understand it very well. But this, it could, this could be, it was perfected, it could be mounted on a high rail. And um, this would be a godsend to the railroads. Yeah, high rail. I'm, I'm, I don't know how the weight of the vehicle will uh, interfere with the measurements, because uh, that, that was my only concern. So I was looking uh, at some other platforms, and I have well, and that are very light, lightweight that you can uh, sure. uh, just roll them over over the rail and take the I'll measurements the in between. The yeah. That, that will work. So you don't, you don't want to have any other loading on the track when you take these measurements because this is going to change the deformations. 
So this, this can be, measurements can be done during a, a natural thermal cycle. So sun goes up, heats up the rail, take one measurement at night, take another measurement, here are your two temperatures. We've seen that we only need about uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 degrees uh, between the temperatures, separation between the two uh, temperatures. And we still believe we can get data. Of course, the bigger the, the differential, the, the better for the uh, measurements. Alternatively, uh, we use heat strip, heating uh, strip, heating strips. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is, um, <laughs> one of my oldest friends and colleagues in the rare industry is Jim Lundgren, now retired from AAR, and as he described this problem, many people have blunted their or dulled their sword <laughs> trying to solve this. But I encourage you to keep on. You oh. know, Thank you. This is this is this is an FRA funded uh, project, and uh, I think they're they're also excited about the idea. I mean, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. I know I know all the uh, failures in the past, and I, as I said, today what I present as a success maybe become a bullet of things what not to do in the future, and that's okay. <laughs> you got to keep trying exactly. So. <laughs> Uh, because we need to take images on the side, the drone may be a little bit more tricky to do. I mean, taking images on the top, yeah, we can, we can do that. And we don't even need a speckle pattern. Uh, for the curvature measurements, we can do projected patterns. So we can project the pattern and take those uh, measurements. Continuous measurements, we have to have a very high, a very fast uh, camera because you're, you're going to see blurring of the image. Uh, so I, I, you know, baby, baby steps, so <laughs> we'll get the method to work first. But, but of course, but drones, drones is, we, we've thought about drones, we've thought about uh, uh, high speed acquisition, uh, but I, I first need to make sure that this method uh, works before we, we run with it. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me.